So today I'm not going to talk about a single book, but I am going to talk about a single leaf from a printed book. And the reason I want to talk about a single leaf is from the perspective of beginning collectors or students, even some dealers, I can understand how expensive, if not unaffordable, an interesting old and rare book is, especially one of any historical significance. But for a modest price these days online, you can actually purchase a single leaf uh, from a very interesting and important old book. And this affords a wonderful, tangible way to study the history of printing and history in general that you cannot get from a uh, history textbook itself. Now I want to examine the leaf from as many aspects as possible, from its topography, from its paper, from its influence on language, from the text itself to the printer. But I can only touch upon these in a very cursory fashion. I'm not a scholar, I'm not a historian, I'm only a bookseller, I like to say. Uh, but I do want to provide these as avenues of exploration for a printed text in your hand. And I hope you will find uh, it a useful way to examine a printed text. Let's look at the leaf I have here then uh, that I want to talk about. It is actually a leaf uh, from uh, William Caxton printed in 1482. Now Caxton was famously England's first printer. Now unfortunately, a leaf of Caxton can be quite expensive. So sort of defeated the purpose of this a misguided video, I should end it right now. Caxton leaves can range from the upper hundreds of dollars to low thousands of dollars, depending on the particular leaf. But I will show towards the end of this video two much more affordable leaves. I actually bought them on eBay for $50 a piece from equally interesting books to show you how affordable these things can be. But for now, let's look at uh, the leaf I chose of Caxton, one of my favorite printers uh, to discuss. Now, um, I should say we should start with the historical context, probably. And I would put the beginning date, let's say, at uh, 1422, when Henry V, the King of England, died on the throne. Now, Henry V was one of the last great um, hero kings of England, forever mortalized by Shakespeare as uh, Prince Hal, and in the model of a King Arthur. And of course, he unified England, and he valiantly went to battle against the gallant French at the Battle of Agincourt. But the very year that he died, William Caxton was born. And I would say, despite all the deeds and heroics of King Henry V, the influence and impact and importance of Caxton on English history was even greater. And that is because he introduced to England, for the first time, the art of printing. Now on that foundation, all of the achievements of England for the next centuries could really rest, including the flourishing of Elizabethan literature, the age of exploration, scientific advancement, all the way through the Industrial Age, which was really enabled by the democratization and the dissemination of information from the introduction of the printing press by William Caxton. Now, Caxton served as a uh, apprentice to a cloth merchant, a mercer, in England. And when the mercer died, he moved to Bruges to complete his apprenticeship. And Bruges was one of the great commercial centers next to Venice. And Caxton was a highly capable businessman, and he quickly rose uh, through uh, the ranks of nobility and into royal circles. And by 1468, he had actually become the governor of the sort of self-contained nation-state municipality of the English in Bruges itself. And by 1469, he had negotiated an important wool pact uh, with Charles uh, the Bold, one of the last great uh, chivalrous uh, kings of Europe. And in those royal circles, he came upon a very interesting book. And that book was the uh, history of the, the Requiem of the History of Troy by Raoul Lefebvre. And the noblemen of Europe were very interested in ancient Troy, uh, partially because they wanted to trace their lineage all the way back uh, to Troy, much as if you were in Starbucks in Greenwich, Connecticut, and you uh, were drinking a latte with somebody who wanted to boast that they descended from somebody who got off the Mayflower. 
Now, in those circles, so Caxton decided he wanted to translate uh, the uh, work into English. Now, he was not very confident of his abilities in English or in French, uh, but with that can-do attitude and uh, the support of Margaret, the wife of Charles uh, the Bold, he saw through his production to the finish and printed the first uh, book printed in English, The Requiels of the History of Troy. Now, in 1475, being the shrewd businessman that he was, he sensed the political winds were shifting and uh, they were declining uh, in Bruges. And in England, they were on the ascent, if not stabilizing, with the end of the War of the Roses and the more stable ascension of Edward IV to the throne. And he thought if he moved back to England, he would have a better chance of commercial success by serving his king and country. And lo and behold, he moved back and he established a printing press in Westminster, a very clever location because it was close to the clergy uh, where there was a strong demand for printed works. And he went on in subsequent years uh, to print the very first book printed in English on English soil, the Dixon Sayings of the Philosophers. Uh, and he followed that up by other monuments of printing today, such as... Uh, the Canterbury Tales of Chaucer, printed, I think, in 1480, as well as this book, uh, printed in 1482. Now, as I said, let's talk about another aspect of printing. One of the first things I like to examine is topography. Now, topography is very important, and when I look at Caxton's work, at least in this example, it looks rather gothic and cramped. And to understand why, we have to understand the general context and if we look at the manuscript tradition in Europe, uh, many early printers followed the manuscript tradition very closely because they wanted to smooth the transition to printed books and sell directly into ready-made markets. And these scribes and illuminators were employed both by not only man for manuscripts, but also by printers. And they took artistry to such heights uh, that it is, was not equaled in England during the period. Uh, so when Caxton came to England, because they did not have that deep artistic tradition as they did on the continent, it was a more of a virgin fertile ground for the establishment of a very practical printing enterprise. And Caxton took full advantage of that by focusing on the commercial aspects rather than the artistry of printing. Now, he did bring over with him type uh, that came from, I think, the type uh, cutter uh, Johann Veldeber in, uh, in Bruges. And those type uh, came from the Burgundian manuscript tradition. If you look at Burgundian manuscripts and you compare them to Caxton's type, you will see strong parallels. But it wasn't out of that artistic desire that uh, Caxton used those type. I think it was out of necessity. He actually had access to those type. He was familiar uh, with them. So he employed them in his printing. But they were not very suitable for printing in the sense that the type is not particularly legible, I would say. And uh, the page from a modern aspect is very interesting, but I can't say it's particularly beautiful, at least when compared to some of the finest productions of Europe, if you look at even uh, the, a page from the Gutenberg Bible, which was printed in the decades earlier. The press work of Caxton also did not rise to uh, the same standards that were on the continent. Now you can look in this example, and the ink in different areas is darker and lighter, and it misses that beautiful, smooth uh, uniformity of ink that you find in many of the continental printings of the period. So he was not the most artistic printer, and actually in the 16th century, many people derided Caxton uh, for that, including such people as the reformer John Bell. Uh, but his reputation has uh, soared in the centuries that followed, of course, because of his great importance to the history of printing itself. I will add one more thing about topography, and that is that Caxton introduced into England the letter W, which is not traditionally a part of the classical Latin alphabet, but for which I am forever thankful as a Weinberger, uh, of course. Now, another aspect of the printed page closely allied to topography is the paper. And it's a curious question, where did Caxton 
get his paper. Now, it's believed Caxton got his paper from many sources, uh, much as it like Tim Cook today at Apple gets his supply, a thousand suppliers to make the critical components of an iPhone. And we can examine the watermarks of a page. Now, the watermarks are, you can see when you hold the paper up to light, and often they give us a good indication if they're present of the paper mill and where it was located and approximately when it existed. But it's not a hard and fast rule because watermarks were often produced over sizable geographic areas and sometimes for extended periods of time. But they do give an indication. Unfortunately, in our example, we do not have a watermark. It was probably on what we call the conjugate uh, leaf. But it, uh, it is quite interesting where he got his paper from. Now, most of the paper was probably still imported from uh, the lowlands. And there was a very strong uh, trade in uh, cloth and wool uh, uh, between Flanders and England. And I'm sure printer, uh, a printer like Caxton piggybacked on top of that uh, to import his paper. Uh, let's not forget also that a lot of the early paper was really rag paper, so that makes a lot of sense. But Caxton, at least in my opinion, did not also print with the highest quality paper, uh, as evidenced by a lot of the foxing and leaves I find compared to some of the leaves of, uh, you know, let's say German printers that can often be snow white in the period. And that again underscores that this was a commercial enterprise and not uh, an enterprise suited to the highest artistic uh, uh, pursuit. So that is the paper. Now let's talk a little bit about the language. Now, Caxton is quite famous as being one of the fathers of the English language. And sure enough, out of necessity for printing, he had to take one particular dialect from all of the regional dialects in England, and he chose what was called the King's Dialect or the London Dialect. And by the very act of printing, that dialect became the predominant English dialect. So he had tremendous influence on the English language. And also, I would say, in uh, the inflection of some of the words used and the syntaxes had great impact even on the spoken word. Another interesting aspect of Caxton's influence on language was actually the spelling as well. Famously, uh, he took the word ghost, which was spelt in Old English G-O-S-T, and because he employed a lot of Flemish typesetters, and in Flanders it was spelled G-H-E-E-S-T, he inserted the H into the Old English spelling, forever making the modern spelling, so not only was he important, uh, to the history of the English language, but of great importance to Halloween because we would not have ghosts was it not for, were it not for Caxton. So uh, now let's get to the text itself, which is quite important. Now the actual text is a historical chronicle. This is the Polychronicon printed in 1482 by Ronulf Higden. Now this chronicle was originally written in the 14th century in Latin, and it was not translated into English into, until, I think, 1387 by John Treviso. Now, Caxton was a shrewd businessman, and he knew that an old English chronicle would not sell in the market, so he had to update it. And update it he did up to the year 1460s himself, and he used uh, as aids other medieval chronicles of the period. And sure enough, he had his finger on the pulse of the market because it was a very good seller for him, and probably his best sellers, evidenced by the larger number of surviving copies of the Polychronicon today than almost any of Caxton's other works. Now, that is the general work. Of course, we have a specific leaf from the Polychronicon, and our leaf discusses Persian history. It was, of course, uh, a historical chronicle not only of England, but of the world. And our leaf discusses King Darius and King Cyrus. And that's of particular interest to me because it speaks to one of the earliest East-West connections, which I really like. Other people focus on different leaves. I was recently at the Boston International Book Fair and I ran into Bill Kalush of the Conjuring Arts Center. And he told me he had bought a Caxton leaf for the Canterbury Tales. And the reason he bought it is his specific leaf contained within it uh, the first conjuring trick. So obviously that was of great interest for his magic library. So the text itself uh, can be quite interesting. And actually that goes with 
whether you purchase, let's say, for instance, a leaf from uh, the King James Bible. Some people want a leaf from Exodus with the Jews escaped from Egypt and other people uh, would like uh, a leaf, let's say, from Matthew or something. So the text is quite interesting. So that is uh, this leaf from Caxton explored uh, from different avenues. And as I said, you can take each of these and apply them to uh, any printed uh, leaf or text in your hands. Now I did want to talk about, as I promised, two leaves that were more affordable. And I have them right here and I purchased them on eBay for about $50 a piece. And the first leaf is printed in 1472, so only 17 years after the Gutenberg Bible. And it's printed uh, by uh, Johann Mentelin of Strasbourg. Uh, and it is a leaf uh, from Nicholas de Lyra's Postilla on the Bible. But you can explore it from many aspects. If I was looking at paper, I would immediately note that the margins are wide and it's really a fine quality paper and much wider than the less expensive paper that Caxton used that I mentioned before. But you can also explore the rubrication, uh, the topography itself, and the general historical context. And I just think it's amazing that you can buy a leaf within the first 20 years of printing at such an affordable price online. And the second leaf I bought is from the man with the greatest influence on the English language, uh, and that is Shakespeare. And it's actually an original leaf from the second folio from 1632. So this is taken from The Tempest. I, again, think it's absolutely amazing for a small amount of money that you can buy an original uh, leaf from an important Shakespeare folio. And I'll conclude uh, this little chat just by reading one of the more famous lines uh, from The Tempest here. And it's, I might call him a thing divine, for nothing natural I ever saw so noble. And I like that line because, again, printing and books are themselves so noble. So thank you so much for watching, and I hope you will tune in for other videos about rare books and the rare book trade.